inflation of the muscles in your wrist that like pinch down on it. Yeah, I think the, the bones are called the metacarpals, mm -hmm. and, and that's why it's like these bones you feel in the back of your hand like this, and um, that's and what they call it carpal tunnel like syndrome. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like right here where the hands are. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. where so there's the, actually where a really cool thing with the tendons that run up from your arm and your hand. If you relax your arm, you can uh -huh. involuntarily uh -huh. close your own hand. Oh. Or do it somebody else. Like if you just relax it, you know, <laughs> just squeeze on your forearm. Yeah. No. Well, I know. I, I yeah. I mean, I I, know, I I get some carpal tunnel pains. Like I used to play drums, and that. That'll do it. Oh yeah, yeah. That does it. All right. So before we get started here, just a couple of quick reminders. So tonight, the paper two proposal is due. Um, Tuesday, we're having our review session from twelve to two. So bring with you uh, the vocab sheet that I just gave you, uh, which has uh, thirty-five terms on it. Um, there will be 15 for you to choose from on the test. You'll choose 10, but studying all of the terms will help you with the essay questions as well. Um, because I will be incorporating these ideas into the essay questions. So yeah, it's probably a good idea to bring these, the sample essay sheet with you as well. Um, the exam itself is going to be on Thursday in this room from 1 to 3. Except for you, because you can't be there at that time because of sports. Yes. We'll be there Wednesday from 10 to 12. Yes. And your final paper is due on Monday the 9th. Now, Bree, uh, you're graduating, so I think I have to get your grades in earlier than everybody else's. Uh-huh. We can talk. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay. Yep. And but, uh, the only other thing that I want to uh, re reiterate here, this is only aimed at one of you and you know who you are. I need you to upload your notes and bibliography from the presentation, um, just so I can get all of those graded and out of the way. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about anything before we get started? Everybody's good? Everything clear? Great. So, what do you think of the second half of this poem? Was this any? Was the going any easier with the background that I gave you last time? You did not find the going any no. easier, Sam. I, got, I was so confused the entire time. But I think I got the point. I was through like deductive reasoning. Okay. I could kind. Of, I think Nick and I talked about it in the hallway. We could kind of get the uh -huh. idea that it's a "I told you so" <laughs> type of feel, and then at the okay. end, it's like a jump towards like a bright future or a better future. But I okay. don't get a lot of the in between, like where we're going. Yeah, like <laughs> the first third made sense. Okay, yeah. the first three. Poems made sense to me. The last uh, one made sense to me. Yeah. Um, the second third, I'll just say that was a trip. The okay. second third was a trip, and then the third, of, the ne next third of it starts to make a little bit more sense of what he's trying to say. Okay. I wasn't sure what we were on. Okay. Yeah, I got the last part. Where he is like, let's be free. Uh huh. Just make your own choices, and yeah, and you always have fun. Okay. It's kind of like the stages of grief in that way. Like, okay. At the beginning, he's upset because yeah. lecture uh -huh. doesn't go well for him. He doesn't get his. He doesn't get his man. Yeah. And he feels like everybody's an idiot. He feels like uh -huh. nobody's a scholar anymore. Everybody around him is surrounding him and is an idiot. Uh huh. And then he's <laughs> or a coward or both. Yep. Yeah. Uh huh. And then he he moves away from anger and he starts to legitimize it a little bit. He starts to like. Thing. I, I feel like he went through a bargaining stage at some point okay. while he was writing it, but he didn't show it. Uh -huh. He started starting to think in his head, okay, how do I how do I make sense of what my life is? And then he starts to accept it by the end. Okay. And I, I, I think um, it might help if we actually go right to the end of the poem. Because I think we get a, a kind of resolution in the final lines here on page 83. Right? <clears throat> Sleep to the noise of running water, 
tomorrow to be crossed, however deep. This is no river of the dead or leaf. Tonight we sleep on the banks of Rubicon. The die is cast. There will be time to audit the accounts later. There will be sunlight later, and the equation will come out at last. Now, I think the key here is actually the mention of the two rivers, right? both of which are taken from uh, the Greek and Latin classics. One is a real river. One is a mythological river. Um, do any of you know what the river Leith was in Greek mythology? All I can think of right now is the river Styx. Okay, and if you're thinking along the right lines. It's in the underworld. Yes. It's one of the rivers of the underworld. Specifically, Leith is the river of forgetfulness. Right? The, the spirits of the dead crossing into the underworld, when they touch the waters of that river, they forget all of their past lives. So I know a couple of you um, have to be familiar with the Odyssey, right? Yes. You know, the, the scene where, where you know, Odysseus has to you know, perf you know, sacrifice the ram, and all of the... Uh, Spirits in the underworld have to drink the blood in order to regain their living memories. Yeah, this is because all of the spirits in the underworld have touched this river, this river of forgetfulness, right? They don't remember their past lives. The other river he mentions is a real river in Italy. Um, do any of you know what the historical significance of the Rubicon is? what it means to cross the Rubicon. I know people who will know. Okay. <laughs> you know people who know, all right. So the Rubicon was the river that Julius Caesar crossed in order to invade Rome during the Roman Civil War. So to cross the Rubicon, means to make a kind of final decision, right? To stop dithering and get on with it, right? To make a decision that you can't take back. And I think that a lot of the poem kind of vacillates between these two poles, right? Between kind of looking for something to make you forget what's happening and the cost of your peace and of your ease and making a final decision, making a kind of commitment to achieving genuine and lasting peace in a battle against totalitarianism. So I think a key, um, a key canto for this is number 15. And I'm just going to read the whole thing to you because I think we need to see the whole thing. Uh, we need to see this as, as a whole, right, to really understand how it operates. Page 48. Shelley and jazz and lighter and love and hymn tunes and day returns too soon. We'll get drunk among the roses in the valley of the moon. Give me an aphrodisiac, give me lotus, give me the same again. Make all the erotic poets of Rome and Ionia and, Provence, and Florence and Provence and Spain pay a tithe of their sugar to my potion and ferment my days with the twang of Hawaii and the boom of the Congo. Let the old muse loosen her stays, or give me a new muse with stockings and suspenders and a smile like a cat, with false eyelashes and fingernails of carmine and dressed by Schiaparelli with a pillbox hat. Let the aces run riot around Brooklyn's. Let the tape machines go drunk. Turn on the purple spotlight, pull out the Vox Humana. Dig up somebody's body in a cloakroom trunk. Give us sensations and then again sensations. Strip tees, fireworks, all in wrestling gin. Spend your capital, open your house and pawn your padlocks. Let the critical sense go out and the roaring boys come in. Give me a Howry, but Howries are too easy. Give me a nun. 
We'll rape the angels of the golden reredos before we're done. Tiger women and lesbos drum and entrails and let the skies rotate. We'll play roulette with the stars. We'll sit out drinking at the hangman's gate. So let's pause here for a second, right? And think about which of these two poles are represented here by what's being described in this part of the canto. What's going on here? They all want to forget. Yeah. And what are they, what, what are, what are they trying to lose themselves in? What are, these, what are the, the people, the speakers here, trying to lose themselves in? Pleasure. Yeah. Just heedless pleasure, right? Whether private it's, desires. What's that? Private desires. Private, yeah, private desires, exactly, yeah. You know, they just, yeah, like, let's, let's have a good time, right? Even, you know, the reference to Lotus. Um, what's that? Drugs. Yeah, drugs, specifically, you know, the episode in the Odyssey with the Lotus Eaters, right? Who, uh, whose fruits made people forget about home. So, yeah, so this is what, like, forgetfulness through intoxication, right, of various kinds, whether it's, you know, music or sex or drugs or whatever, right? Self-medicating. What's that? They're self-medicating. Yeah. Oh, look who comes here. I cannot see their faces. Walking in file, slowly in file. They have no shoes on their feet. The knobs of their ankles catch the moonlight as they pass the stile and cross the moor among the skeletons of bog oak, following the track from the gallows back to town. Each has the end of a rope around his neck. I wonder who let these men come back, who cut them down? And now they reach the gate and line up opposite the neon lights on the medieval wall. And underneath the sky signs, each one takes his cowl and lets it fall. And we see their faces, each the same as the other. Men and women, each like a closed door. But something about their faces is familiar. Where have we seen them before? Was it the murderer on the nursery ceiling, or Ju Judas Iscariot in the field of blood, or someone at Gallipoli or in Flanders, caught in the end all mud? But take no notice of them. Out with the ukulele, the saxophone, and the dice. They are sure to go away if we take no notice. Another round of drinks, or make it twice. That was a good one. Tell us another. Don't stop talking. Cap your stories. If you haven't any new ones, tell the old ones. Tell them as often as you like, and perhaps those horrible, stiff people with their with blank faces that are yet familiar won't be there when you look again. But don't look just yet. Just give them time to vanish. I said to vanish. What do you mean they won't? Give us the songs of Harlem or Mytilene, Pearls and Wine. There can't be a hell unless there is a heaven, and a devil would have to be divine, and there can't be such things one way or the other that we know. You can't step into the same river twice so there can't be ghosts. Thank God that rivers always flow. Sufficient to the moment is the moment. Past and future merely don't make sense, and yet I thought I had seen them. But how if there is only a present tense? Come on, boys, we aren't afraid of bogeys. Give us another drink. This little lady has a fetish. She goes to bed and mink. This little pig went to market. Now I think you may look. I think the coast is clear. Well, why don't you answer? I can't answer because they are still there. So what's happening here? What invades this canto um, sort of halfway through? The ghosts of those who are dying from what they're trying to forget. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> exactly, the, 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 essentially the people who are allowing the life of ease that middle class Londoners are experiencing because they're in between England and the, and the Nazi advance, right? So yeah, specifically, these people are probably you know, the, the dead of um, the dead of the Sudetenland, um, right? That part of Czechoslovakia that the Nazis had uh, laid claim to and was kind of given over to them in the Munich Agreement. So these people are dying so that <clears throat> McNeese and his friends can remain at ease and enjoy themselves. But I think um, there are a couple of things that I want to point to here 
Um, first off, the reference to Judas Iscariot suggests what? Yeah, that's a clear reference to a betrayal, right? And there's also a reference here to rivers. And I mentioned last time, right, the river image is one that recurs throughout the poem. And I think this is actually probably a good place to kind of bring that in and talk about it and tease out what it means exactly. You can't step into the same river twice, so there can't be ghosts. Thank God that rivers always flow. What's the logic here? Why can't there be ghosts if you can't step into the same river twice? Because time is always moving or something. Yeah, that's the, that's the idea here, right? The time is always moving forward. And that is exactly what the rivers represent here, is that an inexorable movement of history always forward, always forward, right? A river can't flow backwards. What's that? Okay. <laughs> yes. If, if, yes. As long as there are no pixies present. But I think that um, the general tone of the poem overall would deny the existence of pixies. Sorry, I'm writing about Yeats. Yeah. Yeah. Or no. Places. Yeah. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, McNeese um, met Yeats in the mid '30s. Like McNeese was a like a kind of super like a skeptic skeptic about just about go? everything. Um, well, McNeese actually, like, he, he, yeah, I mean, he, he asked Yeats about ghosts and spirits, and he asked him, well, it's like, well, have you ever seen one? And Yeats admitted that he had not, but then kind of triumphantly said, but I've smelt them. Oh, my gosh. This is why we like Yeats. Good Yeats. I would have loved to see that meeting. Yeah. That would have been fun. Anywho, yeah, but the basic idea here, yeah, is that the, the past can't come back. So there can't be ghosts. But you still feel them. Yeah. You still feel guilt. Uh -huh. You still feel the emotion, the sadness, the grief. Yeah. You, like, you may not literally be able to bring the past back, but that doesn't assuage your sense of guilt, right? Or your memory. Yeah, or your memory, right? Yeah. You, as much as you might try to forget, by bombarding your brain with booze. You never forget the one thing you're trying to forget. Yeah. I see it happen a lot with people who have the alcohol problem. They drink to forget mm -hmm. something, but that's the one thing that they can never forget. They'll forget everything else in their life, uh -huh. except for the one thing that they were drinking to forget. Well, I think that it's also probably important, kind of along those lines, to think about where this comes in the poem as well. So this is Canto 15. What's happened in Canto 14? Uh, the election did not go his way. Yeah, so this is forgetting about that lost by election, right? I was like, okay, well, this is the way we're going, right? Appeasement is going to be it. So <clears throat> may as well drink up. But drinking up doesn't make anyone feel any better here because they can't banish these ghosts that keep hovering. Um, and I think what, like this river image is frequently associated um, with not just history moving forward, but also with destruction. Um, um, there is a specific instance that I am thinking of page 24, and I think from, la from last time, I think we might have talked a little bit, of, I think I might have brought this one to you, uh, to your attention uh, last time. On the top of page 24. So that all we foresee is rivers and spates sprouting with drowning hands and men like dead frogs floating till the rivers lose themselves in the sands. So this river image is associated with the forward movement of history, but also with this kind of wanton destruction, right? 
that this forward motion of history isn't necessarily a good or positive thing. And this is where I, I want to introduce the last term I've given you here on your uh, vocab study sheet, um, the one that we haven't discussed yet, proleptic orgy. <laughs> so do any of you know what an elegy is? Nick, what's an elegy? <clears throat> it's a bleak poem. Uh, or it's a can be, yeah. They often are. Think more about content and less about tone. What is an elegy about? What is it concerned with? I don't want to say that it has to do with being abandoned or lost. The future. Uh, what is my God stuff? <laughs> I don't know. I always get elegy confused with eulogy. Okay, yeah, I think, I think that's what's, yeah, that's it. But, but you know, like, there is actually a relationship between elegy and eulogy, right? When do you give a eulogy? A death. Death. Yeah. An elegy is a remembrance poem. Oh, I thought that would be too simple of an answer. Uh, oh, so, 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 so you overthought it. Yes. <laughs> always. We always overthink here. Yeah, an elegy is a remembrance poem. Now, does anybody know what prolepsis is as a literary technique? No. That's, um, that's seeing into the future. Yeah, it's a flash forward. So this seems contradictory, right? A remembrance poem, a memory poem that is also a flash forward. So I wasn't too far off the future. No, you just had, had the wrong half. <laughs> the wrong half of the term there. So this is a term that's coined uh, by a critic named Patricia Ray. And what she means by this is a poem written in anticipation of loss, when the loss is of a familiar kind. And Ray argues that this is kind of the dominant tone of British poetry in the 1930s particularly of McNeese and Auden and their generation, right? So McNeese and Auden are both born in 1907, right? That means that when World War I ends, they're only 11 years old. So not old enough to have served, but old enough to have been aware of it and to have been aware of those empty places at the family table where uncles and older brothers should have been sitting. And then you have, you know, you know, they're coming to maturity in this period between the wars and watching conditions in Europe darken, right? Watching things start to get scarier. And so this particular tone pervades much of their poetry, this expectation that things are going to go bad again. And that that suffering, that loss, that we remember from our childhoods, is going to return. Right? We're going to be experiencing that again. So poems like Autumn Journal are written in anticipation of another disaster that we're going to have to mourn. So I wouldn't say that this poem necessarily looks forward to a brighter future, right? But I think it does stress that commitment to a better future is necessary. Because, you know, we talked last time about, you know, sort of pattern and flux right now. Pattern, um, you know, this poem does have 
certain organizing principles, and one of those organizing principles is the recurrence of particular images. So we got the rivers. One of the other recurring images is also the castle. Now, did any of you happen to notice the kind of a track um, the way the castle image works in the poem? It pops up a lot. I think it was an image that kept coming up whenever he was talking about old Ireland. Okay, yeah, he talks about the castle in, yeah, the, the Irish section of the poem, which is probably the best known and most frequently, like, usually if somebody cuts a piece out of this poem and puts it in an anthology, it's Canto 16, the Ireland section. Um, even though, like, I think that on the whole, that probably has, that, that section probably has less to do with the entire poem and then the message of the entire poem than um, others do. But yeah, there's the, yeah, I think you, you mentioned, I think what you're thinking of is, um, <coughs> He's talking about kind of like Irish insularity, right? He's on page 54. Right? I hate your grandiose airs, your sob stuff, your laugh and your swagger, your assumption that everyone cares who is king of your castle. Castles are out of date. The tide flows around the child, the children's sandy fancy. But we can connect this back to an image at the end of the first canto. figure out where the hell it Okay, right, right, page four. All right, it is this we learn after so many failures. The building of castles in sand, of queens in snow, that we cannot make any corner in life or in life's beauty, that no river is a river which does not flow. So the idea of castles in sand, what does that suggest? You had to go to the sand castle. A sand castle. Sorry. I wanted to say that it's static because okay. the, the sand on the side of the river is what, kind of that same image that I, that comes up when I think of when he was talking about the ghosts uh -huh. and how they're dead and how they're not going to move forward in time. Okay. But I also think since it's a sand castle, it's moldable. It can change through time. Okay. Yeah. Sand castles are moldable and changeable. Yes. That's good. What were you going to say, Brady? Um, a castle built on boats of sand will never stand. Yeah. It's also, it's also going to wash away, right? So the first time the castle image occurs, which is then repeated in Canto 16, we're getting sand castles, right? that they're moldable, they're changeable, and they're also ephemeral, right? They do wash away, right? The waves lap at them, and they're consumed. We get another castle at the end of Canto too. I must go out tomorrow as the others do and build the falling castle, which has never fallen thanks not to any formula, red tape, or institution, not to any creeds or banks, but to the human animal's endless courage. So just sit with that for a minute, think about that, and try to parse what he's doing here with the castle image. What does the castle mean? How do you interpret it? relating it to sand and I, don't know, I just keep having that pillars of sand washes away so uh -huh. in my head is he saying that his homeland where he lives England is a castle and he fears that it's built on pillars of sand and that eventually it's going to wash away and everything's going to go to shit because he foresees the war that's coming I think that's part of it yeah if I think that you're on the right track here I was thinking 
like, um, I don't know, I feel like this doesn't make any sense, but the, <laughs> the, the castle, like, hasn't fallen, uh -huh. like, the country hasn't fallen, Okay. not because of, like, uh, like, big things or whatever, but it's because of, like, the people in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. No. You. No. You. I, I think. I think we're getting somewhere here. Yeah. yeah. Like the pillars of sand thing. It usually refers to the people that you surround your life, yourself, and your life with. Okay. A man who builds his house on sand yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's a spider. Spider and spiders like the web is like super strong. Yeah. So. But the web also requires constant maintenance, right? It has to be spun and respun, right? Yeah. So, it's not, sorry, it's not just mm -hmm. like some simple thing yeah. to like make sure the castle doesn't fall, but it takes like a lot of hard work. And... Yeah, it requires constant maintenance, right? I must go out tomorrow as the others do and build the falling castle, right? What's going to happen if people stop working on the castle? Yeah, that's when it's going to fall, right? Because it's always in danger of falling. But it hasn't fallen yet, simply due to people working hard to keep it up. Right. Were you, were you gonna? Did you have something you wanted to say, Nick? Or? I wanted to, and then the, the, they both got pretty much what I was gonna say. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. She made a good point. And I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so so let, let's then think about like this broader idea that the castle represents. And so we're getting that the castle takes work to maintain, right? The castle requires people to actively build it. But so, if they're all trying to forget, then is anybody building it? <laughs> What's that? If they're all trying to forget, or is anybody building the castle? That's a problem, right? If, oh, go ahead. What, what, are, what are we talking about with the castle? Like, what does this represent? Well, let's, what, 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 let's think about what a castle is, right? Okay. It's what? a house. A very okay. big house. It's a very big house, right? It's a easy house. Uh -huh. It's a defense. It's a defensive structure, yes. Castles are built to defend a territory, right? So what I think is going on here with building the castle is similar to what Elliot is doing in the wasteland with um, you know the ruined tower. You know, he talks about like these fragments I have shored against my ruin, right? I'm just going to keep gathering this detritus of civilization around me to protect me from the darkness that is encroaching, right? So I think that the castle is a kind of like, it's a symbol for civilization and defense of civilization, right? But if, this requi if the castle requires people to constantly be building it, then what does that suggest about the way the poem conceives civilization? <laughs> yes. To work to keep it yeah. It, it, you're right. It, it's a constant work in progress, right? It's never finished. And only lots of people working in concert will help to maintain it. If they don't, if they stop, then it falls, right? Then it goes back into a state of nature and is reclaimed by the landscape. Right, as we see, like I'm sure, like you know, I'm sure we've all seen pictures of ruined castles, right? Once people stop using it, building it, maintaining it, it falls apart. It gets covered with moss and ivy, and you know, it, it becomes a ruin. And I think that this is like the the great fear that animates much of the poem is that if we go in this direction if we take the path of leaf, right? The path of forgetfulness, then <clears throat> the castle will fall. 
And I'm trying to think about, like, you've got me, you mentioned the castle in the Irish section of the poem, Canto 16, and you've got me thinking now, it's like, how the hell does that canto fit into the rest of the poem? <laughs> and I think I'm actually kind of getting, I think I'm starting to get something here that I had never really thought much about before. So Ireland declares its independence from, from Britain, well, in 1920, and then wins that independence more or less in 1922, right? The free state of Ireland. is created as a political entity, right? And <clears throat> at that point, Ireland is still, a, it's a British dominion, right? But they are given um, management of their own affairs, right? So they're basically independent um, as long as they're willing to, you know, pay homage to the, to the king and all. Now, by 1937, so a year before this poem is written, Ireland declares itself a republic, writes a new constitution, and completely severs its political ties to the British Empire, except in the north which remained part of the United Kingdom and still is to this day. So, <clears throat> Ireland's official foreign policy was neutrality. And this is actually, this is a fairly common strategy that's taken uh, by small countries that neighbor larger, more aggressive countries, right? You know, if you are officially neutral, then your bigger, more aggressive neighbor has no pretext for invading you, right? Um, for example, like this, this is, for example, why Switzerland has historically always been a neutral country, because it's smack dab between France and Germany, who are always going to war with each other, right? Is that why people always say that they're playing Switzerland? Exactly, yeah. yeah if, you say, if, you, yeah if you're having an argument, if your friends are having an argument, you say, well, I'm, I'm Switzerland, right? Well, you mean, like, I'm not taking a side. Right? I'm not in this. Yeah. Just go around me, please. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, neutrality is, is it, it's, it's something that small countries tend to do to protect themselves, right? McNeese didn't really think much of Irish neutrality particularly um, in times of intense crisis, right? While he was generally sympathetic to Irish national uh, aspirations, he also felt like the threat presented by fascism was uh, so severe that neutrality was not morally defensible. So his critique of Ireland here, right, this whole thing, you know, that the, the idea that everyone cares who is king, your assumption that everyone cares who is the king of your castle, right, that <clears throat> Ireland is so caught up in parochial attitudes and in historical sectarian hatred that the Irish aren't able to look beyond their own borders and see the threat that's coming. And that England is between them and that threat, right? Um, there's a poem he writes during World War II called Neutrality, um, which is, it's in a very, the first, the first several stanzas are written in a very Yeatsian mode. And it's talking about like, this kind of beautiful fantasy Ireland um, you know, it's kind of this land of dreams and of fairies and beauty and all that. And then the last two lines are, and off the shore, off your shores, the mackerel 
are fat on the flesh of your kin. Right? The idea being that you're getting this beautiful dream space at someone else's expense. Right? Very much like what's going on here in Canto 15, where these ghosts appear uh, to remind the party goers of what other people have had to sacrifice. So, <clears throat> are there particular parts of the poem that y'all have questions about? Or even that you feel like you understand a little better now and want to talk out a little bit more? Uh, Canto 14, like the very last line. Wait, no, okay. that's Canto 13, never mind. Okay. I can't the end of can't cancer thirteen. Yeah. I just really like the final line. There ain't no universe in this man. <laughs> okay, yeah, and I think that's a, you, I think you've picked up here another one of those um, another one of these patterns that recurs in the poem. Um, so as we know it, so McNeese was professionally speaking a professor of classics, right? So he taught Greek and Latin. And much of his education was in classical philosophy. So what he's referencing here is the dispute between the Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle. So Plato champion the idea of the universal, right? That everything in the visible world is just an imitation of these kind of universal ideas. And that the particulars, right, the things that we detect through our senses, don't actually matter. Or with Aristotle, said bollocks to Plato, we can only understand the universal through our experience of the particular, right? It's only through our senses that we gain any real knowledge of the world. And how do I know what a table is unless I've actually seen and touched and sat at a table? You can go on and on about your ideas of tables and the universal table and all that fun shit, right? But if you haven't experienced a table, then you don't really know what one is. In Red Light 2, didn't you have a whole spiel about the table and the reality of the table and the table existing? I probably did. It was fun day. That sounds, like the, that sounds like the sort of thing I would say. It stuck. <laughs> I'm glad it did. And <clears throat> I think, yes, so if we, yeah, let's actually look at a little bit more of this thing. So the, what this particular canto, Canto 13, is about, what it's concerned with, are his education and young adulthood. And how a lot of the things that he learned as a university student were not applicable to the world outside of Oxford, right? Even, even though he remained in the university, right, first as a lecturer at University of Birmingham and then at Bedford College in London, right? <clears throat> These, the notion of universal ideals, he found, tends to fall apart when you are faced with other people's specific particular circumstances. So if we start on page, uh, you know, 43 here, towards the bottom, right? But certainly it was fun while it lasted, and I got my honors degree, and was stamped as a person of intelligence and culture forever, wherever two or three persons of intelligence and culture are gathered together and talk, writing definitions on invisible blackboards and non-existent chalk. But such sacramental occasions are nowadays comparatively rare. There is always a wife or a boss or a dun or a client disturbing the air. 
Barbarians always. Life in the particular always. Dozens of men in the street. And the perennial, if unimportant, problem of getting enough to eat. So blow the bugles over the metaphysicians. Let the pure mind return to the pure mind. I must be content to remain in the world of appearance and sit on the mere appearance of a behind. But in case you should think my education was wasted, I hasten to explain that once having been, once been to the University of Oxford, you can never really again believe that anyone said anything that anyone says, and that of course is an asset in a world like ours. Why bother to water a garden that is planted with paper flowers? Oh, the freedom of the press, the late night final, tomorrow's pulp. One should not gulp one's port, but as it isn't port, I'll gulp it if I want to gulp, but probably I'll just enjoy the color and pour it down the sink. For I don't call advertisement a statement or any quack medicine a drink. Goodbye now, Plato and Hegel, the shop is closing down. They don't want any philosopher kings in England. There ain't no universals in this man's town. So I think getting to that last line here that you cite, that you kind of cited, Nick, like, what's weird about this line compared to the others in the poem? The voice. Okay, yeah, what's different about the voice? It's, uh, how do I say it? It's, it's a little more country, it's a little more soft-spoken, it's a little more, uh... Yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> a little more yeehaw, I like that, yeah. It's, it's um, less intellectual. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, um... He's using what would be regarded among his own class here as vulgar slang, right? Upper middle class Oxford graduates don't say ain't. That is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> and he's using that, like, you know, he, he's using that to deny what was in large part the essence of his Oxford education, right? This idea that these these big ideas, and not the specific particular everyday things, are what matters. So it's a, you know a kind of gesture of like both class denial and um, rejection of Plato in that particular line of philosophy, right? And this is the other th you know this is one of the things that keeps happening throughout the poem, right? Is that you know. <clears throat> the particulars keep invading, right? Specific circumstances keep wandering in to remind the poet or any other speakers that are involved here of what's going on around them. So these private worlds keep getting invaded by public events. And one of the other patterning um, elements here is the radio. And this is probably what we'll finish up with. But did you, did you notice, um, like, whenever the radio comes into the poem or the wireless, um, particular words that, are, that appear around it? Let's start here with page 22. Canto 7. Hitler yells on the wireless. The night is damp and still. And then on page 24 in the same canto. Right. <clears throat> and must, we suppose, become uncritical, vindictive, and must, in order to beat the enemy, model ourselves upon the enemy, a howling radio for our paraclete. Okay, first off, does everybody know what a paraclete is? Okay, so this, I didn't, ex I didn't expect you would know what, what this is. Um, the paraclete um, is uh, specifically, uh, like, like the, the tongues of flame that descend oh. On the uh, on the brows of the uh, of the disciples at Pentecost, in the Acts of the Apostles, and allow them to speak all tongues. 
But that's not actually, I think, the important part of um, the phrase, just for your kind of knowledge. So what do you notice? So Hitler yells on the wireless, a howling radio for a paraclete. What is the radio associated with? Yelling, loud, angry. Yeah, angry shouting, right? And for, yeah. And remember, like in 1938, widespread adoption of radios is still fairly new, right? So this is fairly new technology that is uh, invading this poem. And what is a radio like? What is a radio like? What does it allow for? Yeah. Long distance transmission. Yeah, long distance transmission, like one way, right? <laughs> one way, long distance transmission. It allows you to hear messages from far away. So even when the people are at their ease here throughout the poem, there was always this voice from, hall, from far away howling at the edge of their ease, right? at the edge of their, the, the boundaries that they've corrected for themselves to remind them of what's going on elsewhere. And I think that, like this is like, like one of the like I think one of the more effective uses of new technology in 30s poetry, right? So Auden and Spender and some of the other uh, 30s poets would like they write these poems about how beautiful gas works were or electrical pylons or you know other such things. Uh, whereas I think McNeese seems to have a better sense of both the positive and negative aspects of new technology. Um, you know, he, there, there's, there's, you know, in Canto 14, there's, there's a pretty good description of, you know, driving fast as well um, in an automobile. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I guess like that's really kind of all I have for you today. Like, do you guys have any further questions about this? Um, I have a little one. I just yeah. always like to make a note. When was this published? Like what year? What year? Okay, so this is it's written in the autumn of 1938 and published in January of 1939. So published before war is actually declared, but when pretty much everybody can see it coming, right? So yeah, World War II didn't begin until September of 1939. There's like a little notes. Yep. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, I know that you are probably all exhausted and tired of listening to me. But, um... <laughs> I do just want to say, like, before y'all go, like, that I have really enjoyed having the four of you this semester in class. Um, and this has been, this has been a lot of fun for me, and I hope that you it has been my least stressful yes. class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have no Good. idea. Good. I Good. haven't Good. had a real breakdown over this class. <laughs> well, All of the other ones, yes. Okay. Well, well, good. Let, let, let's. Let.